Hey, thanks for joining. You're listening to the Coach's Locker Podcast with Chris Four, and I really appreciate you being here. This is episode 37. 37, if you've been following along here this July, last couple weeks, I am putting my book, Building Championship Caliber Football Programs, on tape. Today is chapter five. We're going to get right into it. Developing a work ethic, teaching your team to put in the time. One of the top 10 characteristics of a state championship program, developing a work ethic coming right at you and right after the intro. You are listening to the Coach's Locker Podcast with Chris Ford, a place for all coaches to call home. The Coach's Locker Podcast is a part of the Football Coaching Podcast Network. Please visit footballcoachingpodcast.com to hear and see our entire lineup of top football coaches coming to you every single podcast with valuable information to help you and your program. The Coach's Locker Podcast with Chris Ford exists to help prepare coaches to be hired for the job of their dreams and to provide coaches with dynamite resources to become even more successful in their field. You can reach me on Twitter at at Coach4, that's at C-O-A-C-H-F-O-R-E, and my podcast home is at 8laces.org forward slash podcast. That's 8laces, E-I-G-H-T-L-A-C-E-S dot org forward slash podcast. Welcome to the Coach's Locker Podcast with Chris Ford. Now, let's get after it. So as you probably know, you've probably been listening, I surveyed 106 head football coaches from 42 different states. I asked them each three questions, and then I took all their answers and I boiled all their answers down into the top 10 most common characteristics of a state champion football program did this from the 2011 season but folks i'm sure if anybody and i've never seen anybody do this kind of research uh to be honest with you people probably have just not you know didn't publish it in a book like this but uh pretty wide reaching 106 schools 42 states I uh, felt real good about how much input we had and the coaches involved. I mean, some tremendous, tremendous coaches. So to kick off this chapter, chapter five on work ethic is Hal Wasson, tremendous coach out from Texas. He was at South Lake Carroll High School back then. Keep the vision alive with a great work ethic and have the ability to persevere. Randy Drelling from Hutchinson High School in Kansas. We believe a program needs an identity to be successful. We built ours in the weight room the entire year. Keith Croft from Bishop Hendrickson High School in Rhode Island. The most important part of our team this year was their work ethic, especially with the strength and conditioning. It was developed as a program from the winter into the summer and throughout the season. It helped keep us healthy and focused. That's Keith Croft out in Rhode Island. From Jeff Craddock, Tarboro High School in North Carolina. He said, I believe we get a competitive edge during our off-season training program. We work extremely hard in our off-season and our weightlifting speed development program is run just like a practice. The players are pushed to extreme levels and a total commitment to our program is required. Every class at Tarboro High wants a chance to become state champions, and they are reminded on a daily basis that only one team in the state will be the best. Never let your opponent outwork you on any given day. Our phrase is, somebody is going to get better today, it might as well be Tarboro. That's again from Jeff Craddock at Tarboro High School in North Carolina. I love that phrase. I'm sure he's got that on t-shirts, on bulletin boards in the weight room that's a really really great one you should steal it from dale mueller highlands high school in kentucky the biggest thing we do differently is that every day throughout the year it is important to us to develop as football players and as men we try harder on a year-round basis because it means a lot to us we are 73 and 2 holy smokes 
We are 73-2 and two and have won the state championship the last five years. Not because we know something that others don't or have some unique scheme. We do believe in our schemes. We are a high-speed offense that snaps the ball as soon as the official sets it. We are a complete two-platoon team. Although we are a public school with only 400 boys in the school, we will have 160 of them out for football. All the coaches are speed and strength coaches, and they all work with our players year-round. Our players try harder on a year-round basis than players at other schools. If anything but that last sentence is emphasized, then my message on how to be a consistent state champion is missed. Again, Dale Mueller out in Kentucky. The last quote to kick us off here at this chapter from Tim Brabant, Carsonville Point, Port Sanalic High School in Michigan. That's a mouthful. Carsonville Port Sanalic, Sanalic High School in Michigan. The most important aspect to this year's team was phenomenal work ethic, character, and athleticism. We had a group of seniors who refused to be outworked or outplayed each and every week. You cannot win unless your kids are 100% committed year-round. For instance, our kids don't drink pop. Speed, strength, and proper rest and nutrition are the three phases of the triangle we focus on most. Have your kids play as much football as they can in the summer, seven on sevens, attend one to two team camps, and have the seniors set up some captain's practices. Don't make your kids feel like they've locked in a position like a robot. Teach them to think for themselves so that they do not have to think at all on the field. Offensively, you have to save things for the tournament. Defensively, you have to be willing to adjust and always be flexible. They work our speed training regularly and lift with excitement. Without a doubt, the number one answer, the number one answer from the 2011 state championship head football coaches when asked what they did differently than the other schools in their league, section, and state was their work ethic, and specifically their off-season program. That's right, number one. This was the number one thing coaches said they did differently or better. These coaches were convinced that nobody worked harder than their program did. Championship programs develop their football players on a year-round basis. Those who fail to do so will fall behind the teams who are preparing themselves themselves 12 months a year. Develop your year-round philosophy. We provided the structure and programs for our player to put work their tails off. Hard work equals success. That's from Mark Del Percio, or Percio in Middleton High School in Delaware. What is your off-season philosophy? What do you do with your kids when football is over? Have you been able to sit down with your staff and develop your philosophy? It is critical that you have a philosophy for the off-season. Your philosophy will need to be supported by your athletic director and principal. Some of the things you need to consider when developing your philosophy for the off-season include Do you support student-athletes playing multiple sports? If you do, will those kids lift during their basketball or baseball season? Have you spoken with the other head coaches at your school about your off-season program? Do the athletic director and principal support a year-round off-season program? Folks, I can't tell you how how key that is. You've got to see what the philosophy is at the very top. Because what's going to happen eventually, if you're trying to get kids in the weight room, and they're not in there, and then you're going to want to cut them, will that be supported by the principal? Okay. What if a kid wants to join the school play, which consists of three to four hours of after-school preparation? We allow your football players to participate in that? How do you continue to monitor their grades in the off-season, and what effect does that have on their participation in your off-season program? Will you give kids some time off right after your season, or you get right back at it? What kind of program are you going to use for developing strength and conditioning? What about family vacations, church mission trips during the summer? What is your policy regarding students who miss three weeks for a -a once-in-a-lifetime trip on an African safari with their grandparents? True story from 2007, I believe it was. Had a kid's uh, dad approach me, he's a coach. Uh, My son's going to miss for three weeks and it's not during the dead period. I know you want them to get away during the dead period, but 
His grandparents have been uh, planning and saving money for a safari for 10 years. They're taking the whole family. Once in a lifetime, can my son go? My philosophy as a head football coach has always been, if you're in town, you need to be here. Okay, you need to be in the weight room. But if you've got a vacation planned, go enjoy the heck out of it. I firmly believe that because kids are only kids once. They're only with their families once. So that kid left and he was a two-way starter. He walked right back in and had his position. What about during finals week? Are you going to have kids in the weight room on and on a, and on the field during the week of finals? Are you going to pay your coaches extra money to help with the off-season program? So there's a lot of questions there you need to consider if you're a head coach or going to be a head coach. As you can see, many, many items need to be tackled and wrestled with to help and shape and determine your philosophy of your off-season program. My policy as a head coach had always been that if you're not playing another sport in the off-season, your tail needs to be in the weight room, preparing your body for the next season. When many of you reading this book played football in the 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000s, most kids played many different sports. Over the years, that has changed. I still think it is best for the student-athletes to play as many sports as they can. Will this slow your preparation for your football sport? Perhaps. Perhaps it won't. That is a philosophy you have to determine for your program. How will you handle multi-sport athletes? It can be a sticky issue with the other head coaches on campus. No matter the case, you need to make sure that everyone is on the same page. From other coaches, to the players, to the administration, to the parents of your football players. Quote from Michael Bates, Little Snake River Valley High School in Wyoming. Isn't that a Wyoming high school name? Little Snake River Valley. The advice I would give to other coaches is that the season does not begin in August. It really begins after the last season ends. Now, some kids do other sports, and that's okay. As a matter of fact, I push for that. However, if they are not in a sport, I try to get them in a weight room and or to study film. I get them to understand that the season is one out of the season is one out of season not daring if you want to win a state championship that is what it takes another quote here from ed homer he was at christ church virginia high school in 2011 strength weight training for physical strength is a must but so is competing for overall strength our most valuable players were all multiple sport athletes the one or two kids that did not really start for other teams in all cases there were kids that had injuries and were thus not able to play a winter or spring sport last year, were valuable. Cogs in the wheel. But the true strength, spiritual, physical, mental, came from the kids that had competed in varsity sports for three or four years in more than one sport. Raising the bar. Eric Kumba from St. Thomas Aquinas High School. The most important factor in our championship season is the fact that our kids bought into what we were trying to do. When you are in a new situation, change isn't always welcomed, but we were fortunate enough to be in a great situation. On a day-to-day basis, our football players were challenged to make themselves better, and we never took a day off from stressing that philosophy. Whether it was finishing a run or a block in a team period, being a good teammate and giving a quality look during an individual rep, or knowing all the answers to the questions during a film session, we raised the level of expectation, and the kids met us head on. Quote from Hal Lamb, Calhoun High School out in Georgia. Very successful coach out there. I think our off-season program really got us over the top mentally and physically. Mentally, I think our kids believed they could beat anybody because of the work they put in during the off-season. In 2006, I took over as a head football coach at Capistrano Valley Christian School in San Juan Capistrano. They were 0-9 and 5 and they were 2-8 in 2004. My first year there, we went 5-5. Five and five. We lost two of those games on the very last play of the game. We were that close to going 7-3 and three after a winless season. The number one obstacle I faced was a lazy work ethic. The kids were just not used to working hard. They were not used to lifting weights during the season. They were not used to watching film. They were not used to practicing hard. But as we started to win, they started buying in. They started to see the fruit of their labor. The kids were so used to losing over the last couple years. I don't think they had a winning season in the four years prior to me taking over. 
I told them at the first meeting, I have gone to the playoffs every year as a head coach, and it would not change this year. Many kids, I'll never forget this, they came up to me afterwards asking if I really thought that we could go to the playoffs. Never forget that in all my life. Three of the kids, three kids came up and said, you don't really mean that, do you? The playoffs, you know what our record was last year? We started talking about going to the playoffs and winning right away. Do not shy away from that. My kids bought into that right away. When they knew I believed we could win, they believed we could win. You have to set the bar high. The kids will jump over it. By the way, we did go to the playoffs that year. Work smarter, not harder. Have a plan. From Kevin Wright, Carmel High School in Indiana. Indianapolis. I'm not sure exactly what we do differently than other teams in our state, but I do know that we have a 12-month calendar that we use to ensure we are doing something every single day as coaches and players to improve. We break those 12 months up into preseason, season, and postseason, and we have specific goals that we want to accomplish during each of those periods. We use the old philosophy regarding plan your work, then work your plan, and everybody in our program is bought into this approach. From Kevin Wallace, Bowling Green High School in Kentucky. The chemistry of a team is developed in the months of training that lead to a season. The leadership of our coaches and seniors established a great foundation for our team as we worked in the winter months. The work ethic that results from our training in the offseason has been a core of our success for many years. It allows our players to push each other to new competitive standards and develop a toughness level that will allow them to conquer the adversaries that a season brings. From Joe Kinnon at Manatee High School in Florida, revised strength and conditioning program was the most important aspect of our championship team this year. From Lenny Schroeder at Canastota High School in South Dakota, weightlifting is the major component to our success. In our conference, if you are not strong enough, you will get pounded. We play in the toughest nine-man conference in the state of South Dakota. That's right, he said nine. We develop the importance of lifting by making it the sole criteria for a player if a player letters or not. Quarters of play have nothing to do if a player gets his letter. Who is to say that a freshman hasn't worked as hard as a senior? Just because a senior plays more? Our players have to lift 90% of the scheduled lifting days during the season. We lift two days a week during the season. Once they are hooked, getting them into the weight room during the summer is easy. You can find probably 100 different philosophies on how to develop strength and conditioning in your program. You want to use a system like Bigger, Faster, Stronger? Several years ago, kettlebells were the big thing. Are you going to use those? Olympic lifts? No Olympic lifts? You're going to focus on adding bulk or speed, or both. You're going to lift and run three or four or five days a week, before or after school. Are you going to hire a strength and conditioning coach or do it all yourself with your staff? Most important aspect of our program is our strength program. We lift weights throughout the off-season, summer, and in-season. We probably lift as much as we practice. We had two injuries out of 65 guys over a 14-game season. Boy, that's phenomenal. Those two guys only missed a combined four games. That's phenomenal right there, boy. That's from Bolingbrook High School out in Illinois, John Ivlo. From Mike Favero out in, out in Utah, Logan High School. We incorporated sequencing as our strength training program. Sequencing is an innovative strength training program developed by Dr. Matt Ray, the main focus of which is training the central nervous system. We also trained metabolically by using football modeling. Joe Harbor from Norway in high school in Ohio. First off, we had an exceptional group of kids with a senior class of strong leaders who have been talking about believing in and building toward the goal of a state championship since they were 7th graders. This past offseason, we challenged them to make that dream a reality by dedicating, working, and pushing themselves at a level that neither have before with the help of an outside trainer and agent of change, Rick Sugini. This intense offseason not only prepared us physically for the 15-week run it takes to win a state title in Ohio, but more importantly, it built us up mentally and developed our character, or as we called it, heart power, to a point that no opponent 
circumstance or challenge ever seemed too hard or caused us to doubt ourselves. Again, Joe Harbor out in Ohio. As you can see, again, a lot of different things need to be thought out regarding your strength and conditioning program. What is important and what my research shows is that you find something that works for you and you stick with it. Sit down and develop your plan for the weight room. More research is out there than you will ever be able to read regarding how to make kids bigger, faster, and stronger. You can talk with 10 different head coach in the same head coaches in the same part of the state. They might all do things differently. The absolute key here is to have your staff and kids work smarter in the offseason, not necessarily harder. Develop your plan, track the progress of your kids, and evaluate what you're doing every year. How will you know that your program is working if you aren't tracking the progress of kids? If you don't see vast improvements in their 40-yard dash times from January to June, you probably aren't working smarter. Your kids might be working hard, but are they getting better? Are they getting bigger? Are they getting faster? I'm a big believer in data. Numbers never lie. I've been surprised to talk with coaches that don't ever track their kids' progress at all. I think tracking is very important to, so that you can continually improve your program. This approach is part of working smarter, not harder. Keith Croft from Bishop Hendrickson High School out in Rhode Island said, One of the unique things that we do at Bishop Hendrickson is an off-season point program where athletes earn points not only for weightlifting but also for good grades, community service, and playing other sports. This allows us to not only monitor our students during the off-season, but also encourage them to actively engage in the school community. Hold kids accountable. Jeff Van Luer from Bridgewater Emory Ethan High School in South Dakota says, Acceleration Program. We run an acceleration program during the summer months in which we have a high percentage of our players participate. Last year we had 97% of them in the program. Take a drink of water there, folks. Tim Brabant from Carsonville Port, San Alec High School in Michigan. What separated us from the rest of the teams was our commitment to our off-season strength and conditioning program. We had 100% commitment two hours per day, five days a week for the entire summer. Our players were much stronger, faster, and polished than the players on the other teams we played. Our ability to maintain our focus and efforts on our team philosophy of one rep, one day, one team, and one week at a time really gave us a psychological edge on our opponents throughout the season. One of the absolute musts in your off-season program is holding the kids accountable. Accountable to being there and working. You need to have an attendance chart and use it on a daily basis. This tool will help you stay on top of your kids and know where they are, who is and is not working. Depending on the size of your program, keeping an eye on your team in the off-season may be a challenge. That is why keeping accurate records is important. What happens if a kid bails out on lifting a few days a week? What does your philosophy say? What if mom and dad call and excuse him because of an out-in-town relative is visiting? Accountability by you, the head coach, in the offseason will build a work ethic in your team. If kids know that they can miss the workouts and nothing will happen, they will miss the workouts. If they know that you are serious about your policies regarding the offseason program, that you are going to hold them accountable, they will take it as serious as you do. What are you going to do when one of your star players tries to buck the system? I had an NCAA Division I kicker in my program. I think we've talked about him in the past episodes. My first few years as a head coach. He also played some receiver. He had a tremendous sophomore year. His first year ever playing football. I recruited him right from the soccer field. Our head coach moved. I took over the program. So he tested my policy. A few kids did. He failed to come to anything during the summer, but still wanted to play. Our policy helped that was helped to be set by our player committee said that if you were out of town, our policy was that if you were in town, you work out. If you're on a vacation with your parents, on a church trip, all you had to do was notify me in writing ahead of time. It was a simple policy. I've always supported kids spending time with their families and churches during the summer. But the kids and families must communicate with me so I know what's going on. 
Well, this kid wasn't around all summer. He missed the first day of training camp. Two practices. That's back when they were training, you know, two-a-days. He showed up the next morning and wanted to practice. Our team was stretching. He was late. Everyone knew what our policy was and what is going to be tested for the first time under my watch as a head coach. Would I succumb to a star athlete or hold to our policies? This was my second day ever as a head coach. We didn't let him play. He said, hey, coach, I heard you need a kicker. The whole team was watching. Nope, we have a kicker, I responded. He left. At the next water break, I had five or six leaders come up to me and say things like, thank you. I'm glad you did that because he doesn't care about the program. Our special team suffered that year, no doubt. I'm not going to lie. Our kicking game was not as good as it was the year before. However, the expectations were now set in stone, and every kid knew that our coaching staff meant business in regards to our off-season program. If you're not committed, you do not play, period. That kid came back very strong the next season. He hardly missed a day all off-season. He had a fantastic senior year, was recruited by several schools, and went on to kick in the Sugar Bowl a few years after leaving us. The ending to the story here was a good one. More thoughts on work ethic from coaches. Others do it, but we feel like we have one of the best off-season and boot camps around. We teach our kids to push past their comfort zone and to think about their teammates more than they do themselves. You have to convince your kids that the only way to be successful in life and in football is hard work. You have to convince them that we are going to be the hardest working team in the state. You have to convince them that on Friday nights, they have to be willing to play harder, faster, and more physical than the opposing team. That's from Texas, the great state of Texas, Thomas Sitton at Chapel Hill High School. Kids made a year-round commitment to football. That's from Billy Kirch, Waverly South Shore High School in South Dakota. Teach players how to work. I think kids today need to be taught how to work hard. Seems to be a lot. It seems to be a lost characteristic that kids do not learn. Also, gaining trust for your program. Getting players to trust in the coaching staff, their teammates, and themselves. That's from Jeff Van Luer, Bridgewater Emory Ethan High Schools in South Dakota. Two more quick quotes here. Most of the teams now are doing what we do, which is putting time in the weight room and attending summer camps. A few years ago, we were one of the only teams that did this, but now everyone has tried to copy what we do in the offseason. That's from Mark Gibson in Bismarck High School, North Dakota. He also says this, time. You have to go the extra mile at all times, winter, spring, and especially summer. I don't have much of a life during the summer. I'm either running young age camps in town, taking our team to different camps, and spending six hours a day in the weight room. You must make the commitment if you expect your kids to. And now we come to our timeout period. If you haven't been listening to these podcasts on my book, I encourage you to go do so. I encourage you to do so. You can find all the podcasts at 8laces.org. Again, that's 8laces.org forward slash podcast or on footballcoachingpodcast.com. And what I've been doing, folks, is we've been going through and at the very end of each chapter for my book here, I've got a part called timeout, a section called timeout. And I ask five questions for you to take some notes and reflect on, for you to reflect on kind of what you've what you've learned, what you've thought about from this chapter. So question number one, I interviewed more than 100 state champion head football coaches for this project. Their number one answer to the question, what did your program do differently than others in your league section and state that led to a state championship was work ethic. These coaches were convinced that nobody worked harder than their program did. Championship programs develop their football players on a year-round basis. Are you convinced that nobody works harder than your program in your league, section, division, and state? Why or why not? This might be a really good thing for you and your coaching staff to talk about. Are you absolutely, in the book here I have it in italics, are you convinced, bold, italic, underline are you convinced that nobody works harder than your program in your league how about in your division how about in your state 
Why or why not? And you can pause this now to think about that or write that down. Come back for question two. Question two, what two aspects of your program needed a better work ethic? What are two aspects of your program that need a better work ethic? Question three, from what you have read and learned during this chapter, what are three things you're going to commit to do in order to improve either your personal work ethic? Because you might not be a head coach. You might not be able to improve the work ethic in your program. But what are three things you're going to do to either improve your personal work ethic, the work ethic of your position group, or the work ethic of your program? Question number four. Is your staff committed to increasing the work ethic in your program? Which coach is the weakest? This is a tough question, boy. Which coach is the weakest link in this area? If you're a head coach, is your staff committed to increasing the work ethic in your program? Yes or no? Which coach is the weakest link in this area? Will you be able to get him on board with a renewed vision to increase the work ethic? Or do you need to get rid of them? It's a tough question, question number four. And question number five. How about your players? Are there any players in your program that are roadblocks to increasing the work ethic? If you raise the bar, as we talked about earlier in this chapter, do you think they will jump over it? Are you prepared to lose them? I told a story uh, last in our last chapter I believe it was the last chapter, last podcast. No, it was a little while ago. It was, uh, let me look here. Two, develop your, stay the course, develop your philosophy. Okay. I, uh, I talked about two baseball kids, two of the best kids on our football team. When I took over, you know, that program that was winless, these kids didn't want to lift weights. The baseball was the number one sport. They were going to go play, you know, college baseball and all this, get scholarships for baseball. And so they told me, oh, no, we got, you know, we got our own guy who trains us. We we don't lift. And I, again, my philosophy was, yes, you do. I was trying to change the work ethic there, culture there. And I was prepared to lose them. And, and that's what you have to think about, guys. I've cut a kid every year I've been a head coach. I've cut a kid. As a head coach for eight years. Now, in reality, most of those years, I, sh- I, sh- I should rem- re- amend that statement. I've had kids quit or I've, I've had to cut kids every single year as a head coach. In the, you know, in the summer, in the training camp time. I've had to cut kids who didn't show up for our program. I've had to cut kids who were just a cancer to our program. Or I've had to raise the bar because I knew they would not jump over it. Most talented kid, man. In 2009, we dropped to 11-man football, or we dropped to 8-man football. We were in the lowest division of 11-man, 13 division. We were division 13. And our numbers, this was uh, after I was at a private school. 2008, that big financial crisis that hit the nation hit our private school hard. We fell from 240 to 170 kids. We increased our international students. Those are uh, a lot of them were Asian kids from 10 to 50. So really, the reason I bring that up is we we really had about 130 Americans. Those a lot of those international kids. I think I had one or two, you know, come out and play football. A lot of the international kids don't play football. They're there for grades. And, you know, their parents aren't going to let them come play some form or some foreign sport they never played before. So, anyway, we lost. We went from basically 240 to 130 American kids. And we failed eight-man football. Well, the best kid, the fastest kid on our team, okay? I'm not going to say his name. He's not going to listen to this, but I'm not going to say his name. Fastest kid in our school, okay? Fastest kid in our program. In fact, we kind of designed an offense because we were a double-wing team for a long time. Uh, double wing, wing T, more wing T than double wing. But we, uh, we got away from that. We established, I went and studied when we went from 11 to eight, I went and studied all these eight man programs. 
watched a ton of film and almost everybody was a single wing. So I'm like, all right, everybody's running this wing concept in eight man. I want to do just the opposite. Cause when I ran the wing T, nobody ran it out here. Like in my division in my league, no, nobody ran it. You know, we ran that from Oh one to Oh nine. Nobody really was running it very much there. Yes. There are some schools in Southern California who were running it, but in my section, in my area where I was playing in my division, hardly anybody. Okay. Uh, and it helped us have success because everybody was spread, 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 spread. This was, you know, 03 to 09 where I, I was a head coach. And then I started running the wing T in 01. But I'm, I've always been a little contrarian, you know. So I said, dang, if everybody's running the single wing or double wing in eight-man football. And I mean everybody. Everybody was doing the single wing and the double wing in our Southern California section for eight-man football. So I said, hey, what if we do something a little different? So we spread the field. We went to, I put one kid from two yards from each sideline. Absolutely spread the field. And then, and, and nobody had kids in motion. Okay. First of all, the formation we put in, three linemen, three offensive linemen, a quarterback and shotgun, five yards deep, and then a fullback. Okay. Or actually we called him a tailback. A tailback would be offset from that quarterback. And then we'd have a slot, a kid in the slot who went in motion every single time. And he would split the difference between that wide out and our guard, okay, our lineman. So he would split the difference. And then our running back, our tailback, would be right next to the quarterback, basically. One yard from him, one yard deep, opposite side of that, that slot receiver who goes in motion. And that guy... We kind of designed our whole offense for this one kid, this fast kid, to be in that slot receiver position to run the fly sweep, okay? And I stole a lot of Mark McElroy's stuff at Saddleback College, his fly sweep offense. Watched a lot of his stuff, studied a lot of stuff, talked to him. And again, nobody was doing this. Now, two, three years later in our league, almost every single team except for Avalon went to some form of it. So seven teams in our league. Yep, seven teams in our league. Nobody was running it. We put it in in 09. Half the teams were running it in 10, and then almost all of them but one were running it in 11 because we came in and had blazing success with it, okay? Won seven games in our first year of uh, eight, man. I think I think seven. can't remember. But we did very, very well with this offense, and it gave coaches fits because think about it. All you see, and if you're an eight-man guy and you want my playbook, just email me. Just put eight man playbook in the subject line. Hey, I, you know, I heard about this on uh, your podcast. I'll send you our playbook. You see what we did, but, uh, it was, it was a lot of fun. And like I said, nobody did this stuff around here. Nobody. And, and teams did not have a clue how to line up against us. Okay. Because our running game was the strongest part of our offense. So we had, you know, three backs, you got that slot going in motion every play. So we're putting pressure on you with that uh, fly sweep to the, you know, outside. And then we have a running back and who ran a sweet counter. Okay. If you flow with that fly sweep, we'll counter you with our running back. And then our quarterback ran a sweet counter to it. Okay. And, and then we also ran, a, you know, just a simple dive with our quarterback, a simple dive with our tailback. Uh, we did a lot of fun stuff to spread the field. And then we'd run the ball 10 times in a row. Eight-man football, man. It's pretty poorly coached out here in 80% of the schools. I'll just be honest with you. There's some very good coaches in eight-man. Don't get pissed at me for saying that. Kate, Thatcher, Avalon, Calu under Dave Peters. Okay, there was some great coaching. Uh, Faith Baptist, John Rasmussen. Tremendous job. Israel out at Joshua Springs. Boy, he ran a great program out there. But, uh, you know, it was a fun offense to put in. Nobody was doing it. We had a ton of success. But all that, I just shared all that because I love talking about that offense. It was it was a blast. Oh, yeah, guys would stop covering my receiver because we – or they'd, they'd start cheating way in. 
So we just run a, you know, we would just quarterback and receivers all talked a lot. And it was fun. It's fun stuff. Just hit them, right? The snap, get the ball, release it, easy 10, 12, 15 yard. You know, we designed this whole offense kind of around this one kid. We wanted to be the feature of it. And then uh, he didn't raise the bar. He didn't jump over the bar we raised. So he quit, quit during the spring. And uh, it was like, oh, crap, what do we do now? But we figured out my man Phil, Phil Wilhelm, he carried the ball for us and did a heck of a job. But, hey, that is uh, episode 37. Come back later this week for episode 38. We're going to talk about leadership. We're going to talk about leadership. Okay, in episode 38, again, footballcoachingpodcast.com or my website, eightlaces.org forward slash podcast for all of our show links, show notes, if we have any. There are no show notes um, for this except for a link to my book if you want to buy it. And uh, hey, we appreciate you being here. Next week, I'm going to give away one copy of my book to somebody who does something with the podcast. So got to come back, get a chance to win that book. Thanks for listening to the Coaches Locker Podcast. Chris Ford.